My specific role is no different than my attending position. Um, part of that is based on Utah state law. We are one of those states who whatever your attending position does, you can do as long as they've, they've, you've been trained to do so. We also last year passed the law that you can... Hey guys, I'm Rodalyn. I'm the host uh, for eShadowing. Today we have Jasmine Charles. Let's see what we see. She's yes, we have Jasmine Charles, who is a PAC, of course, and she specializes in maternal fetal medicine. Let me just turn her on. Here we go. I just learned more about, I don't think we, we did a few OBGYN, but this is like more specialty focused or um, high risk pregnancy. I'll let her take the floor. Hi, Jasmine. Hello. Hi, thank you so much for coming on. Yes, of course. Thank you. Yeah. So guys, as I said, we have Jasmine Charles, who is a PA in maternal fetal medicine and also sits on the board of the um, Association of Physician Assistants in Obstetrics and Gynecology. And she's also part of the University of Utah's PA program, um, leading the women's health rotation. So really excited to have you on and learn more about your journey and the work that you do in maternal fetal, fetal medicine. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you. So we always get started by, of course, wanting to learn more about your journey, uh, your journey to PA, why you chose PA, how you found out about PA, how long you've been a PA, and how it was, um, you know, getting your hours, you know, completing your prereqs, applying to PA school, and then um, go from there. Okay. Um, I actually have an undergraduate degree in nonprofit management and ran an inner city boys and girls club and was a community domestic violence advocate. I worked in um, rural areas and the healthcare providers that I regularly saw were PAs. Um, I spent my young life really determined that I was going to do something that would change the world um, and thought that nonprofit was the route to go, but it was a lot of work and not a lot of money and exhausting and we still needed healthcare. So I um, left that job and I actually became a medical assistant for a dermatology um, office, private office, and earned my hours that way. I graduated from the Utah program 10 years ago. So I'm 10 years out, started school in um, 2010, graduated in 2012. And I was the last class that did not have a minimum required number of hours. So I actually went in with very few direct healthcare hours um, and a whole lot of um, caring for humans in other ways outside of healthcare. Um, I honestly thought since I was little that I would deliver babies um, and made a t-shirt on Martin Luther King contest in, in third grade that said, I have a dream to deliver babies in Africa. <laughs> so um, I went to my PA interview with that t-shirt in my bag and, uh, and journeyed through applying to PA school, um, got accepted on my first year to PA school, which is really unusual for most of us, um, and then plowed through school. I left school and um, worked for the community health center. So I took care of primarily um, non-English speaking, Spanish speaking, undocumented uh, women and their children. So, so I was a pediatric and a family practitioner, but I did peds and women's health. And I did that for almost five years um, when the University of Utah um, asked if I was interested. I had done a lot of my elective rotations in their women's health team. And they asked if I would like to join their women's health team, which I then... Um, decided to do. I'm the first and only PA employed by the maternal fetal medicine department at the University of Utah. The rest of my team are nurse practitioners. And I went from being a general provider with the rest of our maternal fetal medicine and OBGYNs to um, running specialty care. So I now am a clinical director and a researcher of what we call super rad. So it's our substance use in pregnancy recovery addiction dependence clinic. So I specifically do addiction medicine and psychiatric medicine with women who are pregnant, planning pregnancy or postpartum, and then also um, the incarcerated population oh. in Utah. Oh, wow. I'll talk about underserved. Like, that's amazing. Wow. So, uh, but I'm sure that it's like, you know, especially working in, um, like, within, like, a more high-risk population, there's a lot of um, 
it's I'm sure it's it can be hard and difficult to get through with the patients in terms of like compliance and getting them to adhere to like you know the the regime the regime and the plan or the treatment plan and also um, I'm sure that you also have like therapists on board and like a whole team working with these types of patients as well. We do. I have a multidisciplinary team, uh, myself and Dr. Marcella Smith, who's my addiction medicine or my addiction medicine and maternal fetal medicine doctor that we started the program and run it together. Um, we have a team of somewhere between 15 and 25, depending on the day. Um, our, we like to say we beg, borrow and steal most of our um, support within clinic, our learners or residents and fellows. So we don't have a lot of paid staff as far as our mental health goes and our, our additional care, but we do, we do have um, learners and volunteers. We have a lot of community entities with us. So we like to offer a one-stop shop um, and, and meet women where they're at. So we run a program where you are welcome through the doors, no matter where you're at or where you want to go. Um, just please come back for care rather than being out in the wilderness. Right. And you said you started this program? So I what, did. What motivated you to um, start the program? Um, when I started here at the U, uh, Dr. Smith had also just started recently, and she had a couple of patients on buprenorphine, so one of the medications that we can use for opiate use disorder. And um, I had had a fair amount of contact with substance use disorders at the community health centers, um, but at that point in time, advanced practice providers could not prescribe buprenorphine for OUD. So um, I asked Dr. Smid what her plan was and what she was doing with these couple of women, and she said, I don't know, but there's a lot of them, so what should we do? Um, and the two of us sat down and built a clinic that started with five of us and has now grown to the to the 25. We do two days of clinic a week. Uh, we see 80 women between our two days. Oh, wow. Wow. That's, that's amazing. And so like what has been like, um, when did you launch this? And like since launching, like I know you've grown, but what has also been the outcome? I'm sure like it's had, had a really positive outcome, but like what have you specifically seen from it? Um, we are five years out, actually, we just had our fifth birthday in, in August. And so what we're, what we're seeing as an outcome, to be honest, is that it's a more acceptable line of practice. So we are one of, um, about six specialty clinics in the country that do what we do. We're all pretty intensive researchers. So 80% of my time is spent on, on federal grants and, and investigational drug trials, um, trying to figure out how to, how to navigate preg um, pregnancy and substance use disorders. Um, and so what we've seen is that we're grateful to say that we are continuing to grow immensely, which is heartbreaking because more and more women need us. Right. We are also seeing that more and more providers, thanks to our ability to educate, are able to feel comfortable in caring for women themselves. And so we're not, we're not the only, we, we're not the only monopoly. Right. I got it. Okay. I'm going to back. I have a lot more questions and I'm sure students are going to start asking questions specifically about that. But I want to backtrack a little bit and talk about your experience in PA school, um, just to give students a more insight um, on how it was. And can, can you talk some more about that, how the journey was from, was from being like pre-PA to PA student and, you know, the learning, the, the rigors of the program and how you adapted? Yeah, um, we are a 27-month program here at the U. And we spend the first year in the classroom and then um, about another semester or so before we go out into full-time clinicals. It was intense. Um, we fondly like to say, and my classmates who are still some of my best friends, we all still say that it was like drinking out of the fire hose for 27 months. Um, mm -hmm. Some really diligent planning on study time, um, kind of every minute of every day was clocked out uh, and, and planned in. And then we are one of those programs that fortunately, but unfortunately have tests on Monday, every morning, Monday morning. So we'd spend Saturdays. Um, I had a, I had a study group um, and the four of us would spend Saturdays at the library for a certain chunk of time. Um, we would all go spend Saturday evening doing something we wanted to do. And then Sunday um, we'd either meet up in pairs or just study individually. Uh, I think I thought going into clinical rotations that it would calm the time quite a bit and that you just go to kind of your eight to five job and go home. And it was quite the opposite because you're left without your classmates and you're left navigating new um, electronic medical systems every every rotation and, and a new preceptor who has a different way of wanting things done and a new way to teach. So just the same, I think through the whole thing was just this very intensive kind of nose to the ground, making sure 
you're getting through and you're getting it learned and you're getting it done. Um, cause we have, we basically do med school in 27 months. Exactly. Right. right. Um, and so I'm guessing that OBGYN was like your favorite rotation. Is that how you got a job or what was like the, um, hiring process like or job hunting process like as a new grad and rotation? Yeah, I, um, our program at the U, our mission is surrounded by um, underserved and rural and at-risk medicine and family practice. So I um, wanted to be a family practitioner, thought I'd be a family practitioner forever, um, loved to care for children, and was very lucky to finish PA school in a year where there was quite a plentiful pool of jobs. Um, I came out of school with four offers. Oh, wow. And, um, yeah, and took the one that I thought I would have taken from the beginning, which was to go with the community health centers. Um, and so for me, I'm, I'm not someone honestly, who's ever really applied and sought out for a job. Um, my job here, my job, when I became a clinical associate for the PA program and started to teach, um, somebody was retiring and asked if I was interested in, in taking that position. And then my job here at the U, um, I certainly fought through clinicals and things for that. I was one of the few students who was on maternal fetal medicine. I did a month in the neonatology um, ICU. So I had done some pretty intensive specialty care to demonstrate my drive towards women's health um, and, and high-risk children. And so when the job came up here at the U, although I was offered it, I believe that I had kind of built that from the time I started my way through school. Okay, perfect. Um, so you guys, if you have any questions, um, make sure to leave them in the uh, chat or in the um, question box. So I'm going to move on to talk more about your um, current role. And so can you tell us more about like um, the day in the life, like walk us through a day in the life from when you clock in to clock out, um, the patients that you see. We have an idea, of course, the patients that you see, but how they present and um, what you do day to day. Yeah, so I think I'm really blessed as a PA because my day to day is pretty different every day. Um, I I like to remind PAs that we you know we we are team based care and that's what we signed up to do. But you also can you can you can do whatever you want. Um, and I think and I'm regularly reminded that I am kind of an example of that. Um, Dr. Smith and I call this this our empire super rad and we have we've built an empire and it is run the way we want to. So my Mondays and Tuesdays are spent clinically. So a little bit more like what part people probably envision, although my clinical setting may be quite different. My Monday morning is spent hundred percent online taking care of any incarcerated woman who is pregnant in the state of Utah or uh, Nevada. And so I see incarcerated women with the help of a nurse care team that is in the incarceration facility. And then they'll come and see me twice in their pregnancy in my, in my live in-person clinics. Um, so it's like virtual so and then it's like virtual in person. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I get here at about seven and I spend about an hour and a half with my lead MA and my MA staff, um, going through some messages and making sure we're ready to go before the rest of our team arrives. Um, Mondays at noon, we sit down to a case conference. We do, uh, 10 minutes of an educational lecture, which our learners are in charge of. Somebody teaches something every week. We case manage every patient that's on our caseload. And then we have a full afternoon clinic. So my Monday afternoon clinic that I just finished, um, well, that my team is still finishing, but is, um, is it's got a schedule available for 20 patients um, and it's usually overbooked. So we see somewhere between 20 and 28 patients. It's myself and a second attending and then our learners. Yeah. Uh, so we, and we have a social worker, uh, we have peer supports, we have an ultrastenographer and a phlebotomist on our team. Um, and so we, we care for our patients. Our patients get to us by referrals. We've been doing this long enough. Now our patients get to us by each other. Um, Child Protective Services sends us a lot of our patients, the incarceration system as they transition out. We do take care of women who are in treatment centers. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have a lot of colleagues who send people our way. So that's my typical Monday. My Tuesday looks very much the same, but it is a three attending panel and we have 56 scheduled on our, our schedule. We case conference at seven. I meet with my my leadership team at, or I, I meet with my leadership team at 7 a.m., I case conference at eight. We start seeing patients at nine. We see patients solid through the day until about six or 7 PM. Um, and then I firmly believe in doing today's work today. And so I do not take my charts home. 
Um, I am very blessed in the summer to have a work study scribe. Um, so my summers are a lot easier this time of year. I'm back to dictating and, and scribing my own charts. So depending on the day and how intense our care was, how many I had to inpatient or send by air med, if they needed more intensive care than, than where we were, um, I could, I leave by nine or 10, but I do leave with my charts closed. Okay. Got it. And um, so that's Monday, Tuesday. And then are you, um, are you ever at the university of the um, Utah PA program as well? So I used to be at the PA program every Wednesday morning teaching clinical skills. Um, I've given that up now because of the intensity of the specialty work I do. Um, and so I teach uh, seasonal lectures. So I teach the women's health series. I teach some of the substance use disorder series. And then I go in and do a lot of our ethical work there. The rest of my week is spent researching my Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. Uh, we are mobile in a van. A lot of days. So I do go to homes, I go to homeless camps, I go to treatment centers, um, working with my women who are on my research studies. I do some injectable versus sublingual buprenorphine studies. Um, I treat hepatitis C in pregnancy. Um, and then we have a, a methamphetamine study postpartum. So we're looking at medications to help with methamphetamine cravings. And that's pretty mobile one of those days. Um, another day it's kind of on call. I have a research office where I'm writing papers and I am responsible for all the phone calls, all the messages and all the lab follow-up for anybody we've seen within our clinic earlier in the week. So that's happening as well. And then I go to a lot of meetings with FDA yeah. and scientific study people. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's amazing though. Um, so I think I know the answer to this question. The student has biology answer. <laughs> um, did you learn the uh, administrative side of healthcare in PA school, or was it something you learned in the field? So I did not have any administrative training within. Um, um, I have a nonprofit management background, so I, I have an undergraduate in <laughs> management. Um, I was a fundraiser and, and, and managed mm -hmm. nonprofits. Wow, that is, thank you, thank you. Um, so do you, Students, you guys have any other questions? Can you tell us some um, conditions that you see in um, in utero, given the like the conditions that the moms present with, and how a baby gets affected? Um, yeah, we we deal with a lot of interuterine growth restriction, so tiny babies, possibly early babies. Um, the majority of illicit substances don't actually have any correlation to uh, fetal anomalies and birth defects. Um, it's, it's more health and socioeconomic status and, and functionality. Um, we, we see a lot of challenges um, socially for moms and for babies because we spend a lot of time reminding people that it is chronic illness. It's a disease of the brain, substance use disorder is. And so um, alcohol use disorder is one of those that you do see fetal outcomes. You can, you can see fetal out alcohol syndrome, um, marijuana use disorder comes with some, some possible outcomes of smaller babies. There's some developmental things um, and some growth. And then I think the really sad thing that we see is methamphetamine use disorder during the time of delivery can lead to quite significant hemorrhage. Um, so we do see loss of life um, on occasion based on the inability to, to manage um, the extreme vasodilation that happens with a stimulant. Oh, I didn't even know that. I guess the other important thing is I don't deliver babies. And I think that's a really important thing for PAs and PA students to know. By law, it is not in our practice act in the majority of states. If you'd like to live in New York, we are laborists. Um, and that's really about it. There's a few other places we do some laboring, but not as intensive as we do in New York. So I take care of mamas who are pregnant. I do go to deliveries. My incarcerated women I go is their plus one, but by law, I'm not actually delivering babies or doing cesarean sections. Right. Right. And, um, what about, um, the, during the postpartum period, um, especially, you know, with this population, I'm sure a lot of them are at risk for postpartum depression. Um, do you guys support them in any way during the postpartum period, or do you, um, make a transition to other, um, community resources or how does that transition look like? So we care for our women for up to a year postpartum. Um, we firmly believe in that. The, the number one um, cause of death of a mom in this country in the first year postpartum, which is actually not immediately postpartum because that is a, it's a bleeding risk there. Um, but, but in the six to 12 month postpartum range is some form of overdose. And that could be from a prescription medication or from an illicit 
opposite use of a, of a medication. Um, and so we keep our moms um, for a year, unless they have a team to transition to um, that they came from or that they're comfortable with. Otherwise they do stay with us. We do have what we call our mammogram clinic. So some of our super rad moms will stay with us for life. Those are our, usually our more severe um, we have moms with fetal alcohol syndrome themselves or with developmental delay from just trauma or childhood um, adverse outcomes who do stay with us because to transition them would be too dangerous. Okay, got it. And so um, a great question I have is, uh, what is the most interesting ph physiologically based maternal or neonate health topic you have studied or researched or heard of lately? Um, so she's interested in that. Um, working at the university, we get all of the extremes from the greater Rocky Mountain regions. Um, I am licensed in five states because of how far of mileage some of our women come. So we see all the extremes of the extremes, like everything that gets talked about on TV and in news articles potentially came through here. So conjoined twins, um, all the cardiac defects, as far as like trunctus arteriosis and, yeah. and, um, and, and heart and heart defects. I think the cardiac defects, both in moms and babies are the most interesting and most stressful for me. Um, but the thing that is nearest and dearest to my heart is, is infectious disease. Um, I, I firmly believe that, that Dr. Smith and I will be part of the team that will eradicate hepatitis C because we are fighting for the rights to demonstrate that it is safe to treat in pregnancy, which means we also could potentially have fetal outcomes of not having vertical transmission. So that is for me, um, my biggest, if I look at like condition, it would be hep C. Um, and honestly, if I look at just care in general for both moms and babies, it's, um, it's the opportunity to give everyone the autonomy to have equal opportunity for healthcare. So I take care of many people who have been downtrodden and condescended towards and declined healthcare for a variety of reasons. And, and just to remind society that we are, we are privileged to be practitioners. And I tell people that they come in and they're like, what am I supposed to do? And I, it's not my rodeo, it's yours. I was the privileged and blessed one to be able to go through school and I have the pen and paper and I can give you the knowledge I have, but you make your choices and you make your journey. And that's what actually gets you somewhere. So and that's what, you know, healthcare equity is about you know, giving everyone the same access to quality care. Yes. Okay. Um, someone wants to know um, about like the ex any extra training you had to do in terms of um, the program you've started and be like the OBGYN specialty or maternal fetal medicine. Um, I have, I did not have to do any to come into the department. Um, I was welcomed in at the level I was at and, and did a fair amount of on the job training. I have since done um, some ultrasonography training. I still don't do a lot of ultrasounds, but I can take a quick gander at an ultrasound and be able to know if I need somebody to read it now, or if it can be read later. Yeah. Um, I can do positioning and IUD checks. I think that was the additional, additional training I had was some pretty intensive, difficult contraceptive placements. So we are the clinic that people come to if you need an IUD that's embedded and stuck removed or next one on that can't be found. Um, we do some of those avenues and those works. Um, I didn't do a fellowship. There are a couple in the country for women's health and OBGYN. Um, and I didn't do a residency or anything like that. It's been, it's been pretty on the job training um, because of what we do. And because we are one of very few, I am, I'm really privileged to, I travel the country and, and speak quite a bit. So I get to go to some pretty intensive um, conferences and learn a lot from them while teaching people what we do. Thank you. And, um... What are there any opportunities for students or volunteers at the facility and what kind of what kind of roles or skills are desired? I know there's no extra training, but is there anything specifically desired for such a role? I, th I think there's got to be some some leadership um involved and I, I think also I mean the role I hold is pretty unusual and unique because typically you would be one of the two arms. You'd either be a clinician who's a pretty intense, I mean, we're basically internists. We call ourselves ob um, cardiologists because of the intensive amounts of medicine we do. Um, but you also have to have just some team building skills, 
Um, and then I think the other thing you have to have is, is some real self-discipline um, to fall in a role like this. We, we don't do easy work here at Super Rad. Um, we, when, when we have a patient that we call Super Rad Light, who might be one of our more, as we like to say, you want to be a, preg- a boring pregnant lady, like that's the goal. If I get a boring pregnant lady around here to anybody else, she's probably pretty terrifying. Yeah. Um, and so I think you've just got to have some ability to know that you can care for people and that you can come to work, but you're also going to go home and that you're not, you can't fix people and you can't save people, but right. you can help people on their journey. And I think that's the biggest thing is particularly in the role that I have. Um, I don't have a great work-life balance. If you'd like to know what my family says about me, um, I have a wonderful family. I have a spouse and I have a, now a, a daughter who's graduated from high school. Um, but they know that they signed up to have someone who works a lot and, um, <coughs> who, when I come home, I'm happy to be home, but it will probably be late. So. Yeah. But you're making such an impact. Like, with patients that you work with, like you're really changing their lives and helping them. So that's commendable. Yeah. We love what we do. Awesome. So this is a great question. Um, how do you separate and manage difficult emotions when having intense or saddening outcomes with patients and some of the women you work with? Um, that is a great question because that is something that people have to figure out how to navigate their whole um, their whole career. And part of it is I have I have a I have a really um, my team will tell you that my addiction in life is my exercise regimen, and I work out at the bar method, and I go every morning at six a.m. So I go to the gym before I've started my day at work. And that is one of my pieces that I start my day centered and focused on myself um, and ready to go to to kind of compartmentalize and figure out what's going on. Our social worker that we have hired recently, um, she is 50% patient care and 50% staff care. So we are working towards a model that um, some of the other intensive clinics have at the University of Utah, where we will have a therapeutic group once a week. Um, and then you are required to go to therapy during work hours twice a month. Um, and, and that's, that's a pretty important thing here, um, to be able to process what we're experiencing and what we're going through, um, and the people that we work with. And, and then you also just, I think the other thing that's important is knowing who your people are. So my team here understand what we do and we understand each other and we understand our often probably inappropriate humor. And we understand where to utilize that and where not to. Yeah. So. That's awesome. Like that your, your job has therapy days, like yeah. requires the staff to go to therapy. I think that's like every job should, yeah. especially in healthcare. It should. It should. After COVID. <laughs> yes. I know. And we don't have it quite built in yet, but we should in the next t- 12 months. So. And I think that's a, it's a really important piece is to understand. Um, I think the other thing, a word of advice I was given that's really important for your mental health and how you do it is if you finish a work year and you've not used all of your vacation days and you have failed at life. Um, <laughs> you guys and that's even if you like sit on the couch and don't end up going anywhere, but you have to use every one of those days. Mm-hmm. You guys hear that when you start working in a few years. So make sure you use your PTO and vacation yeah. days. <laughs> okay. So, um, question, okay, there's a question, does your scope of practice, or more so, we know that, you know, you can't deliver babies, um, but how else does it differ from that of the attending physician in your specific um, role? So, my specific role is no different than my attending physician. Um, Part of that is based on Utah state law. We are one of those states who, whatever your attending physician does, you can do as long as they've you've been trained to do so. We also last year passed the law that you can be a standalone practitioner in the state of Utah. So we actually can work towards the the five the ten thousand hours and the letter and the testing that states we could be independent practitioners. I work for a major medical institution. We have no none of us are independent practitioners. We are we are team based care through and through. Um, but my doc um, there is there is other than delivering, which she, t- she'll take me. To, I mean, if I wanted to go on service with her, every time she goes, I could go deliver with her. Um, but there is, there's nothing else I can't really do. I can first assist in the OR. Um, 
I can do any and all of our procedures. I don't do a lot of our gynecological procedures because our patients don't have a lot of them. But when I was doing general OBGYN, I was being trained to do colposcopies. I did vasectomies, the community health centers. I did circumcisions. Um, so my, my scope is very wide, um, based on what we do here and, and who we are. Um, there's not a lot of, not a lot of it's the scope really is close around where I say there's something I don't know how to do or can't do. Okay. Thank you. So we will ask a few more questions and then move on to the case study. Um, so I had a question I wanted to know, um, being that you work in women's health, um, what was like, and you're, you know, in such a, um, you know, you work with such a specific group of women, how, and what was the impact of like Roe versus Wade and how, you know, you know, I'm sure like it really affected your patients and your practice. So how did you guys address that? Um, we are still addressing that. Um, I live in a trigger law state. Um, and, and we did get, we did, um, the, the ACLU and Planned Parenthood of Utah sued, sued the state of Utah. So we did get a stay and our, our trigger law is, is on hold right now. So we can continue to have, um, terminations. Yeah. I, I work for a government institution. And so one of the interesting things when Roe versus Wade was overturned was we all knew we had to very carefully navigate what we said and what we didn't based on where we work. Um, I'm an incredibly public profile here. Um, I lobby a lot. I've had yeah. a lot of laws changed. I spend a lot of time on the Hill for substance use disorder, for women's health and for incarceration rights. So there's really no corner that doesn't know me, which is, you know, for better or for worse when something like Roe versus Wade happens. Um, I think we all sat down here in Utah and, um, took a little bit of time to grieve, right. um, as in like an hour or two. And then we took a lot of time for action. Yeah. So we've built coalitions and committees outside of our institution. Uh, we have publicized a lot of articles and a lot of opinions, uh, separate from the institution. Um, and then there are, are those of us, I, I actually, I I'm bilingual in Spanish and English. Um, and so I have recently made all of the question and answer, um, video services that are on, um, like NPR and Spanish language channels. And then on the screens at like the university and our, our public hospitals here in Utah, um, answering the questions, both in English and Spanish about the law and what it means and where you can still get plan B and what contraception looks like. We started a rapid um, contraceptive clinic that you could get into within three days. Um, and so we, we, were, we were ready to move and we moved pretty quickly and we still are. For my patients specifically, it's been a lot of time explaining what it does and doesn't mean. I have patients afraid of law enforcement. I have patients who, who are fleeing law enforcement. And so they're afraid to even come in for healthcare, not quite understanding if I go to Planned Parenthood, is it full of officers? And is somebody taking my name and my fingerprints kind of thing? Yeah. Um, even if I'm going for birth control or for a pap smear. And then with incarceration, I am the person who helps women. You, they ha you still have a right to termination if you would like one. If you're incarcerated, it has to be paid for by the individual themselves. And there's a whole other set of processes to it. But for the last five years, I have been the one person who does that because I'm the one connection to pregnancies in the jail and prison system. Oh my gosh. Like, I am so impressed with you. Like, <laughs> that is amazing. Like, you're really advocating for these women. Like, that is just, like, that's making me emotional because that's so, like, great what you're doing. Like, wow, wow, wow. Like, because I, like, when, when I, you know, I read about it, you know, I was like, like, I can't even imagine being, like, in women's health. You know, I see some, some women in the ER, but, you know, it's completely different when they, when they actually come into your office for that and they're like terrified, you know, and their, their bodies are being governed and they really have no choice. So thank you so much for that. No. Thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah. So, okay. Last question before we move on to the case study, guys. Um, okay. So someone said, um, your daughter was only a few years old when you went through PA school. How did that impact your experience? Having a child in PA school. Well, well while you were in PA school. Yeah, my daughter was um, four. She went into kindergarten our first year that we were 
in PA school. Um, I was really lucky to have come home. So that Utah is my home. I'd been living in Washington state um, and my mom and dad are here. So that's the biggest thing that kind of made our impact. I think um, we, we navigated the school system here. I needed all day kindergarten and that can only be done in private school. So I had to figure out Catholic school and getting into private school. Um, a lot of time spent figuring out pickups and drop-offs because your hours are not the same as school. Um, and I, I think the biggest thing to navigating it was knowing that I had a partner and a spouse who was 150% on board with me. Right. Um, you see a lot of divorces, you see a lot of separations, you see a lot of really unhappy families through all medical training, to be honest, but PA school included. Um, and, and so you've got to, you've got to make sure that everybody knows what's being signed up for, because even though you may have lecture from nine to four, so you're home by five, which sounds amazing. Um, for me, it was home by five to sit at the dinner table so that we could all have dinner together. And that was it. Um, cause then I'd be back down to study or out to study. Um, or when I was in rotations, I mean, and this is probably still your schedule, but you know, the ER, you're the 2 PM to 2 AM or whatever it is. You're just never, you're never around and it's not very consistent. Mm -hmm. So I think through PA school, I had to really prepare myself to know that was going to be the case and then to be present when I could be present. And I think that was the other big thing was that when I was going to be present, I was going to be 150% invested um, at home. My family likes to joke because when, before, I, when I was getting into PA school, I was working at Starbucks, um, full-time. So we had health insurance benefits. And then I was working in the, in the Durham office as an MA and I was taking a couple of classes. And so I'd go into Starbucks at four or four 30. And so I'd be asleep. Like if I get home, I'd be asleep on the couch within like 20 minutes. Cause it was just constantly exhausting. So my yeah. daughter, when, when she was little used to be like, well, you're better in school. Cause you keep your eyeballs open. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, that, I think that's the big thing is, is huge family investment and, and know who your community is and build a community. Um, what, you know, even if you don't have family, like I, like I said, I have my parents, but I, my community was bigger than that. I had PA colleagues who we figured out that our kids could go to one place. Like we'd all get together on Saturdays to study and you'd take every single kid. And I'm married to a school teacher. So I'm married to somebody who loves children, mm. but like my school teacher spouse, and then my really good friend's spouse, who was a fireman and they had a farm, like they'd take the kids out on the farm all day. And you know, that you would have happy children, happy spouses and yeah. you would be getting through school. And then once you're through school, the hard thing is, is that we are taught a lot of medicine, but we're not taught to practice at PA school. And so your first few years out are really intensive because now you're realizing that like people's lives are in your hands mm -hmm. and you still have to remember that you, you did it for a reason. And most of us, the reason is a million different things, right? We want to take care of people, we want to help people. We want to, but ultimately we want to feed our families. Mm -hmm. And so you need to be present with that family because you signed up to feed them by this job. Right. And and so going home, again, taking your vacation, making sure you're at baseball games or swim meets or art class or whatever it is, it's that it, I had, I had a, one of my um, preceptors and professors in school who told me, he's like, you don't, don't take a job that you realize your family has grown and you blink. Um, and like I said, I have, I have an incredibly invested in my career family, um, including my child through high school, who's, who helped with a lot of things that we do with our clinic and, and was pretty hands-on, but it's, it, it takes, it takes a village and be ready for the village to be there and then be ready for it to be hard, but also don't forget that you have a family. Yes. Yeah, definitely. You definitely need that village guys. Perfect. So um, we're going to move on to the case study. So um, I don't know if you have something, a PowerPoint prepared, or you want to walk through a case um, of a typical case you would do. It's uh, just going to leave the floor to you. Okay. If you give me two seconds, I mean, I don't have a PowerPoint, but I'm gonna, I've got an, just a note I need to bring up. Oh, yeah. No problem. No problem. So when I have students um, in clinic, I remind them that the medicine that I practice and honestly, the medicine we all practice is not the medicine that um, it, you're going to be tested on. So I actually like to use um, the case study of a 23-year-old um, female who calls into clinic um, asking for some help because she has missed her period 
and isn't sure what's going on and what to do. Um, and she gets an appointment in clinic and we bring her into clinic, um, do a pregnancy test. So I like to say that pregnancy tests in my clinic are like CBCs in most clinic. Um, we don't, we do a lot of blood work, but we, everybody pees in the cup. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's like your, your door prize when you arrive. Um, so 27, when she comes in, she leaves a urine, um, and while waiting for her urine results, go in and take a history. I learned that she's sexually active with both men and women. She's not actually sure when her last menstrual period was. Um, and she's always had regular menstrual periods. However, can't define what that is. Um, no current contraception, no known history of sexually transmitted infections. Um, isn't really taking any medications, um, and, and otherwise, otherwise healthy, um, had her wisdom teeth out and tonsils out as a child. Um, the individual ends up with a positive pregnancy test. Um, and, and so is as far as she knows early in pregnancy, but can't quite date it. And, and where I like to go from there is just the conversation of asking on a scale of one to a hundred, how do you feel about this pregnancy? Um, and a lot of people say, you know, well, well, was it planned or unplanned? And it's a very specific question or how, or, you know, what do you want to do and, and launch into the options of adoption of parenting of, of termination, uh, um, abortion. And I, we, we, I rather like to just talk about what, what does this feel like? And what does this look like for you? Um, and what are the hurdles to this, no matter which way you feel about it? Um, it's that the whole situation is a little bit, a little bit skewed by the fact that, um, and this is not uncommon in our state, um, we live in a, in a, in a highly religi religious state. And so abortion is not believed in um, by the religious entity of which she was raised under, but is not sure she believes in. Um, and ultimately, in the end, after counseling on options, which um, like I said, here in Utah, even now, you still have the option for an elective abortion up till 18 weeks of gestation. However, you have to watch a video, um, which is pretty painful to get through. You must have an ultrasound. You must fill out a 72 hour consent followed by a day of consent. Um, and so it's a, it's a six step process to even get your foot in the door of our one of two termination clinics in the entire state. Um, or do you elect to continue on? with pregnancy. Um, this individual elected to continue on with pregnancy. Um, so we got an, an HCG quant. So looking at what is the, the hormone level of pregnancy, because on bedside ultrasound, you cannot see anything in the inner uterine cavity. And she results to have um, what we could be concerned of an ectopic pregnancy. She's got a pregnancy of unknown origin. Her HCG does rise appropriately over the next 48 um, hours to consecutive. So, um, feeling confident that she's got inner uterine that would be able to be seen, um, and is seen at eight weeks with fetal heart tones as an inner uterine pregnancy. Um, she came in at what, if you look at the HCG levels was probably about six weeks of gestation, um, at eight weeks of gestation, um, she's starting to get on board and, and talk a little bit more about how she feels and what she's thinking about pregnancy. Um, traditional pregnancy care. And then at nine weeks and two days calls in with pretty heavy vaginal bleeding um, is seen in clinic um, bedside ultrasound found to have inner uterine demise and be with a, uh, a missed miscarriage. And so she has had bleeding, but has not passed the products of conception, which leads to an additional conversation of options, which are threefold here in Utah, you have the choice of expectant management. So she could wait and see how bleeding continues and, and pass the products on her own. She could elect for medication and she is under 12 weeks. So she's still eligible for that, which for us here at the university is uh, mifepristone given in the office, followed by misopristol at home 24 hours later. Um, or thirdly, you could elect for a dilation and curatage. So outpatient procedure uh, with mild sedation in the clinic. Um, she elected for a DNC and was scheduled to have her dilation and curatage um, two days later and requested that she immediately have an IUD placed following the procedure. 
Thank you so much. And um, following the DNC, like what's the um, recovery period? What instructions do you give them after the DNC? So following a DNC, we talk about nothing vaginally for six weeks. We will all proudly tell you that the six weeks is a made up number. It's what we say, um, but the cervix is open, increasing the risk for infection. So with tampons or intercourse um, or um, even, even sex toys. Um, so no intercourse for six weeks that you will have period like bleeding for the normal length of a period, somewhere between seven to 10 days. And then depending on this individual elected for an IUD placement. So she had a little bit of a different conversation with, with um, Mency's return, but mostly we would say your, your period should return within four to 12 weeks. Um, but um, it's crampy, there's some bleeding, it shouldn't be too too severe of pain, I, Tylenol, ibuprofen, and a heating pad, typically for management. Okay. And what about following up in the office? So um, the so DNCs, we elect to see back in a month, and that's actually more for emotional support than it is for any form of a medical follow-up. Okay, got it. Okay, um, so are there any other questions, guys? I think we answered all the questions so far. Just going to see if the students have, or questions related to the case study um, that uh, PA trial just went over. So we'll wait on some more. Oh, some information in here. Okay. If you have any questions, you can put it in the chat or the Q and A box. Um, so um, just waiting to see if there's any other questions. But in the meantime, I also always like to ask the guest presenters um, to give one last piece of advice to the students, just a takeaway, um, one thing you'd want them to you know, know in their journey. Um, what advice would you have for the students? I think my takeaway advice would be, no matter what you do with your PA degree, make sure that you love it. Um, that it's something you want to do and that you've sought out to do. And it's for your own health um, and, and, and safety and security, but it's also for the sake and the benefit of the people that we care for. Um, because really every day when you go to work, you need to remember that every single individual, that is their one shot at seeing you and that you with every single person are being privileged and welcomed into the utmost of privacy of which they're offering. People come in and say things to us as PAs, particularly even I'd say, aside from other healthcare providers and studies say this, that they just will not say to anyone else. Mm -hmm. And so despite the fact that it may be the fourth person in your office this week, who's got dizziness and fatigue and you take this big breath and you're like, oh my gosh, everybody's dizzy and fatigued. So am I. Remember that that one person was not the last three people and, and that they deserve that opportunity of the 10 or 15 or 20 minutes, whatever you are welcomed to have in an office, but you are given that, that privilege to have that opportunity with them. And that's the only opportunity that they get. So even though for you, it becomes mundane, it is not mundane from them. Right. Thank you so much. So we have a few questions um, and um. The IUD, the IUD is placed during that um the, the DNC, right? Right, following the DNC. Okay. So we do now pay, place post placental, so right after delivery, and we also place them right after DNCs, but not everywhere does that. Okay. Got it. So and your best question is yes, six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a great question about insurance. Um, does your clinic cover most insurances? Like, um, you know. Given the population, like how easy it is, how easy is it for them to get insurance coverage and um, like, how do you work with them financially? So my patients are pregnant. Medicaid covers everyone in this country pregnant, yeah. regardless yeah. of your citizenship or, I mean, you could be over income, I guess, but right. uh, 90, 95 percent of my patients are Medicaid insured, the rest private insured. Um, sadly, because I work for the university and a government institution, we don't take uninsured unless you can cash pay it, which most people can't afford. But I have a community partnership with the community health centers. I did a lot of substance use work there with, with three specific um, MDs who still take and, and share the partnership with our patients. Got it. 
And what are some goals you have for the next five to 10 years? We are, uh, um, I, just, I, have, I have quite the five to 10 year plan. Um, mm -hmm. we, we are expanding to a third day by the end of this year. Uh, we will be a full-fledged full-time clinic within five years. So it will be the only thing we all do with our own standalone staff and a location. Um, and ultimately the goal would be to have three or four inpatient beds dedicated to mental health and substance use disorders within the antepartum service. Um, I would like to work a little less, um, and live a little more. And what I'd actually like to do is continue to expand my, um, teaching of what we do so that more people do what we do rather than, um, actually doing it boots on the ground. Um, and then research wise, um, I would love to run my own study at some point. Um, I did just recently become a PI for the hepatitis study. So I'm the first, um, so that's my first go at actually being the head of a study. Um, and then going from there would be another something on our list. Okay. And um, so I wanted to ask, um, how long is each appointment slot? And were you involved in research in PA school? My clinic uh, appointment slots are 30 minutes, which doesn't really make any sense. They all, they all lie. There's, it's triple booked. So there's three slots at a time. But if you're a new, you're here for three hours. And then our return patients are here somewhere between 15 minutes and an, and an hour. Usually, um, if I'm running a not my specialty clinic, but any of our other OBGYN clinics, the spots are 20 minutes and 40 minutes. Um, research, I had not done much research at all um, prior to our master's project was a systematic review. So I'd, I'd written a paper and I'd read and reviewed a couple. Um, I dove into research with Dr. Smid because that was something that she was doing. And then our research team that is outside of our department um, really believed in me and has trained me. Um, they've offered me a PhD, which is not something I'm interested in seeking out right now because I cannot imagine going back to school, but that's kind of how I delved into, into my research. Um, and I guess that's the other piece of advice I'd give you on, on the research note. Um, but it goes back to MDs is again, we are team-based practice and no matter where you practice in this country, we are licensed individuals who work with docs. It does not mean you need to work for a doc. It does not mean you need to answer to a doc. And it definitely doesn't mean that you are less than a doc, but um, if you want to do what I do, you have to find a doc who believes in you and wants to help you get there. Um, I spend a lot of time fighting to make sure my name is heard and our practice is heard. I make sure that PAC is on the end of everything that I do, um, but I couldn't do it without Dr. Smith because she's the doctor and the specialty license and is the one who found the avenues into things first. And then we go together and then we've got, we've each got our own separate things, but we are, we are one entity, two bodies, one mind is what we call each other. So you have to love your supervising physician or attending or whatever they call them, wherever you live. Yeah. Yeah. And that's great that you have one that's so supportive and, you know, help you create this program. Got it, pros. <laughs> awesome. All right. So we have one more question we can answer before we go. Um, Okay, um, a lot of questions are coming in. <laughs> um, uh, okay, uh, I guess we'll try to answer two more. Um, what change do you predict coming to the pay profession in the near future? Well, there's a change to our name. Right. Um, <laughs> so I think that would be, I, I think we will be watching us go to a, a required doctorate sometime in the future, I think. Um, also that piece of private practice like we have here in Utah, we might see. Be an option. And um, how can students, um, specifically at the undergraduate level, be more involved with in-person interactions um, given like limitations due to COVID? Um, I'd say find your way into the community services rather than the hospital services. So it is still really hard to get into the, the, the medical institutions, you know, no volunteers, doors are locked. Free clinics yeah. are opening their doors, health fairs, needle exchange. So I spend a lot of time doing rapid testing and needle exchange um, and, um, handing out of like condoms and, and, um, harm reduction things at, in parks and with homeless communities. And you, you all, no matter where you live, have those entities. So you can, you can find, you can find ways to get into even, even working soup kitchens and, and meals and things. You'll find that there's health entities involved in it, giving flu shots, giving COVID shots. Yeah. That's super clever. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, good job, guys. 
So thank you. Thank you so much, um, Jasmine, for coming on and taking the time to answer the questions. Um, I was going to just post a comment, but thank you so yeah. much about the crisis text line. Um, thank you again for taking the time to answer um, the questions and sharing your uh, journey and the amazing work that you're doing with maternal fetal medicine, especially with this high risk population and um, underrepresented patients. So thank you again. Um, we really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. And um, we wish you well and have a great week and have a wonderful week, everyone. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.